Turtles all the way down, I'm Jake, sometimes Jenk. Yes, it has been a while. I do have a few episodes in the can. There's going to be a few of them coming up in short order every uh, few days, hopefully, and I have a few more scheduled as well. Yeah, it's been tough. I'm kind of uh, pulling myself out of something. I'm going through certain uh, changes in my lifestyle, (laughs) withdrawal symptoms, you might say, in certain things. I'm doing more yoga, which is very helpful. I'm up to two, sometimes three times a week. I'm trying to make it an average of three times a week. If I can, that would be great. I think that'll, you know, translate into more success in other parts of my life, not just the physical, but, you know, um, emotional, spiritual, uh, social, what have you. It seems to improve a lot of things if you can just remind yourself that, you know, remind yourself that we are embodied creatures, that we have these patterns of movement and development that have been going on, you know, in our bodies and our ancestors' bodies for a long time. And um, it seems that, you know, humans have been thinking about these kind of things for a long time. You can point to the ancient, uh, what I like to do sometimes, the ancient, uh, you know, Eastern practices of, uh, you know, that meditation falls within, that yoga falls within. Um, These are the fruits of people like me and like you you know, trying to figure shit out, saying, okay, look, I'm this embodied creature in this mysterious universe. I don't know what the fuck is going on, but I do know that if I do this, you know, for an hour a day or whatever, whatever your practice is, that everything starts to kind of fall into place a little bit better. It does seem to work, (laughs) but like with a lot of things that we know are good for us, it's just getting there and starting and doing it in the first place. That's the tough part, you know? getting out there. Uh, and that's why sometimes it's helpful as many of you probably noticed to have a workout partner. Uh, because you know, if you promise a friend that you're going to be at the gym or do a workout with them, you're a lot less likely to cancel than if it was just you and you think, ah, I don't feel like it right now. I'm just going to, I'm going to do it later. Uh, that tends to become a new pattern and that becomes your new habit and that becomes your new norm. And before you know it, you know, you're lazy and sitting on the couch and not doing anything and finding very, you know, you know, very tendential reasons to not do something. Um, but here I am, you know, each step is a step forward. I'm doing this monologue right now. There's going to be an episode released hopefully today and then a few more. And, uh, hopefully this will be the start of something you know, more in the positive direction uh, and the direction of a a habit that I'm happy to have and to encourage rather than the habits of (laughs) a lack of output that have been uh, pretty common lately. So we have this episode coming up. It is with Matt Ratto, who is a professor at the University of Toronto. And his uh, his department is in uh, information science, information, computing technology, uh, that sort of thing, which, I, you know, as you know, I like to talk about and, and focus on, especially as it uh, relates to the human, you know, the human being, the self, and uh, technology and culture. And uh, it was a fun conversation. Uh, we talked about AI as well, as you might guess, and uh, raising children, <laughs> being like developing an AI of your own. Uh, I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you enjoyed the conversations coming up soon talk soon oh the sounds bouncing off of that it's a theory i have (laughs) (laughs) nice yeah well i don't know if you've listened to any of these uh episodes at all but uh, yeah yeah so this one yeah some of our uh, friends have been on it as well and uh i guess i often end up talking a lot about uh maybe indirectly information theory information science information thoughts about information but it, with respect to the to the human being in particular mm. is what i like to look at and i guess uh one thing i was noticing is that you know in the past when certain technologies start to uh proliferate like uh you know steam engines or whatever or, you know pneumatics then people start to think of the human in, in that kind of a model in that analogy and in, in that framework and then think about talking <clears throat> about the human as some kind of a machine in that sense. And then 
uh, more recently, once computer technology has, has come on the scene, people have started thinking, wow, you know, oh, the human is actually kind of like a computer, you know, processing it in that way. And uh, it always seems like whatever is the most current advanced technology, we kind of try to find some kind of analogy to us as some kind of an advanced machine of sorts, computing device of sorts, an intelligence. Um, and I'm wondering, now, right now we have these newer technologies with like VR and simulation theory. So a lot of people are now saying, oh, well, a human being is actually just a simulation inside this universe. So again, we're kind of taking that next step and equating it with uh, uh, the most current technology that we're impressed by. How do you see, the, you know, like the human being in a computing device? How similar different are they to you in, in terms of your theoretical framework? Right. So, I mean, I think in terms of the, you know, that, that desire to explain the human through the technological apparatus or converse, the, the converse, right, to explain mm -hmm. the technological apparatus through the, uh, through the notion of the human, that's obviously a longstanding mm -hmm. move. You can see examples of that in the work of... Um, Da Vinci, for example. Oh, right. right? Yeah. But mm -hmm. the, the one that I think is really interesting right now, because it's actually a repeat of a previous one, is AI, is machine learning and uh, human consciousness and mm. human, yeah. human knowledge. Um, because we went through a period previously uh, in the 70s through the 90s where that was the major metaphor for thinking about cognition and intelligence was this computational model that was both... Uh, applied to our understanding of human cognition, but then r the reverse, as I, as I just said. It died in a, a scholastically, re from a research point of view, it kind of died in the, in the early 90s. And in hmm. fact, in 1992, th there's this period where all of the funding uh, dried up for, really? and it was uh, for artificial intelligence. It was called the Artificial Intelligent uh, AI Winter was what it was called. I didn't like, know about this. So yeah. what happened in the 90s? What, what, so there were yeah. all these claims being made about what this stuff would provide and uh, you know how well the computer could basically uh, mimic or reproduce human intelligence. And that all kind of didn't happen the way people thought right. it would happen. In particular, mm -hmm. there was this uh, central conceit or idea about human cognition and machine intelligence, which was this uh, theory called internal representation, where mm. the, the idea was that humans operated in the world by producing an internal map mm. of how the world worked, and then would use that internal map to plan and situate their actions. And so they tried to build that into these right. computational systems. It didn't quite work. Mm -hmm. And so the whole thing kind of fell apart. So they had a framework of the human that they, as their understanding of it, and then they tried to apply that to the computational framework to try mimic human intelligence. Is that it was more back and forth than okay, that, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. there was, you know, bo both sides kind of working towards the middle. But it all kind of failed <clears throat> mm -hmm. and uh, because it couldn't deliver. Mm -hmm. And it all gr dried up until quite recently, really, where for a range of reasons, including increasing reduction of comp cost of computational cycles and uh, maybe new generation of researchers and things like that, AI and, and now what they call deep learning or machine learning mm -hmm. has come back up. And it's, you know, it's, it's like a, it's like the spring has come, you know, yeah. we had the AI winter now we're in the AI spring and it's a fascinating moment for looking at things like intelligence and things like computation. Is and, that largely, is, is that largely though because of processing power? Because a lot of the software and some of the innovations that you can do are only possible because of increased performance of the, of the hardware in some cases. So there's always kind of, like you said, I guess they're kind of chicken. Yeah. Egg, I, kind I don't of think I'd want to make it. Yeah. Such a deterministic mm. argument. There's right. not just mm. the increase. In well, of course. In yeah. fact, I think what's, what is, what, it, what, we, what we really see is that, that e even though the AI winter occurred and there was this kind of like, mm -hmm. um, uh, slowing down of research, mm -hmm. um, the research did continue, just kind of under the scenes. And so what, yeah. we, what, what we've seen is this incremental uh, increase in capacity mm -hmm. uh, around deep learning and machine learning, often with very restrictive cases. So it's not the broad argument, these technologies are, you know, it's not the general, what they call general AI. Right. <clears throat> this is the self-reflexive, self intelligent mm -hmm. computer. It's more like the computer that recognizes... <clears throat> spoken word mm -hmm. and can convert it into textual information and the accuracy levels associated with that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe it was at 70% accuracy in 1990 and then 
in 92, it was at 72 and, mm. you know, and 75 and 76 and 80 and 90 and so forth. And what, mm. what we've seen is there's been a, a pivot or something in five or six years ago where the accuracy of those kinds of selective or dedicated AI systems have, have passed a threshold where they're actually functional. And then mm. we begin to see things like Siri, <clears throat> Yeah. Google and all these other kinds of things. Like Alexa yeah. and all that. Exactly. Yeah. But mm -hmm. what that is called up again, as you started this conversation with, is mm. a reinterpretation of what it means to be human and, and what mm -hmm. it means to be a, a computer. And we see, and what you, one of the sites where you see those dialogues being taken forward is in popular media. And yeah. so all of a sudden, of course, yeah. a couple of years ago, <laughs> we started seeing all these new movies. Mm. Like her and uh, her, Ex Manica, ex Mac Machina, yeah. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, those two in particular uh, are great, yeah. As examples mm -hmm. of this um, desire to kind of explore the blurry line between mm -hmm. what counts as human and what counts as... I think both of those movies that we just uh, touched on uh, are kind of interesting because I think they both represent, in a way, a seduction of the human by the AI as kind of a threat, I guess, in a way, or at least, uh, uh, you know, some something to look look out for in the future. In the Ex Machina, I guess the test of that whole narrative is basically to see if this, uh, this artificial intelligence robot could essentially convince this guy to let her out. Mm. And this is something that people like to talk about theoretically in an interesting way. And I think uh, the AI is going to be incredibly good at seducing us to do what it wants and we can see early uh, you know early examples of this even in like the facebook algorithms and you know swaying people politically or whatever yeah but marketing but, and yeah. but the point mm -hmm. and, and in fact uh, I, w I just did a, a thing with uh, for autodesk there was, mm. uh, was part of the hot docs festival there's a really interesting uh movie that was part of hot docs called um more than human is that oh, right? I'm trying to remember. I, I remember that title, but I don't think I've seen it. Yeah, it was really interesting, and and uh, there was a, a debate about it, and uh, a, a public debate about it in mm. Autodesk's new glass box uh, oh, really? space, which is on college. It's lovely. Yeah. The thing that I said there uh, that I kind of always come back to with this stuff is, um, I don't think we have to worry so much about the computer or the no. AI, mm -mm. Uh, like the Facebook algorithm, you know, it is not face the Facebook no. algorithm that's doing this. It is Facebook. Right. The people in control of the it. people yeah. and mm -hmm. the, you know, and even things like Hal to, you know, mm -hmm. Hal gets used in 2001 space odyssey as like this danger right. for thinking about AI. I'm not, I don't care about Hal. Mm -hmm. the thing that always disturbs me about that film is the people that made Hal set an agenda for Hal that, dis or, or devalued human life right. over this instrumental goal of the mission. Hal mm -hmm. says in it, you know, this mission mm. is too important. I can't open the pod bay doors. Right. Mm. You know, that's, that's not Hal's, uh, uh, just kind of mm -hmm. r randomly making right. that choice. That was an organizational choice. According to its design principles that were put into effect Absolutely. when they made them. Um, and that's the, inst mm -hmm. and, and yet it, there's a sleight of hand that occurs mm -hmm. where instead of, being worried about the organization or the company or the Facebook or whatever, we somehow we're we're, we're kind of somehow being directed mm -hmm. to be worried about this. Yeah, and that's probably thing. because of the popular culture type, uh, you know, the narratives that we see all the time. People are used to seeing that, uh, you know, it's it's been in sci-fi for for the longest time, even starting with Frankenstein, right? But who, you know? but yeah. right, but mm -hmm. who who benefits? So mm -hmm. the, in my field, which is actually science and technology studies, the question, you know, not just information, but this broader field of work, mm -hmm. uh, the question is always, you know, qui bono? Who benefits mm -hmm. when we believe that, that what we have to worry about is the tech mm -hmm. and not the humans behind the tech? And your answer would be the people that are in control of these technologies right now. They don't really want to. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I you know, uh, if we're concerned about the algorithm, then we're not talking about policing Facebook. We're talking mm -hmm. about policing the algorithm. Right. We're talking about the <clears throat> ethics of computer science. That's yeah. a big conversation that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. We're somehow thinking that those that's a that's something that we need to analyze in relationship to mm -hmm. um, the results of technological work. Mm -hmm. But the context and social values of that technical work they can stay right naturalized the way they currently are. Yeah. Um, well, 
I'm just thinking about, for example, yeah, I, I, all, all you've said there is, is, is kind of indicating that we're kind of in the early stages of this thing and people don't even know how to think about it necessarily of, of what actual threats there are and what are, what are uh, shimmer. But um, uh, what the heck was I going to say? Oh, yeah, like thinking ahead to, for example, virtual uh, reality technology. I'm just thinking ahead to combining a, a bunch of these. Like if you have VR technology where somebody's inside this this realm, let's call it, and, uh, you know, the AI is presenting images and experiences for this person. And uh, one example I give is like, uh, you know, you're in this VR realm and there's a painting on the wall of a, of a woman with a certain figure or look or fashion or whatever, and your eyes dilate and your, your Fitbit is indicating that your heartbeat is going up. So... The AI then all of a sudden has this great information about you. Like, what are you attracted to? So the next character it brings up is going to be closer to what your maybe your ideal is. And then closer and closer, eventually, it could get so good at it that a lot of people will be kind of reluctant to leave that realm because everything is essentially being kind of like a utopian universe built for them on the fly as we go along and getting better and better at that. I'm just curious to what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I... I so the fears of the matrix is mm. what you're kind of describing. Uh, I mean, yeah. right. Mm. Or, or, um, no, I'm, fears I'm only, of I, the seduction of the media experience, which by right. the way, these are anxieties that go back sure. a long way. I mean, uh, I'm just saying we're getting better at it. It's not a different fear. I don't know. I don't yeah. know if we're getting better at it. Mm. Uh, I mean, people thought of things like, so Marcel Mauss, uh, in, I forget, Forget the thing. Civilization mm. is discontent. Oh, something right. like that. Yeah. I don't remember what it was now. Mm. Oh, uh, Metropolitan Life. Mm. S- something about that. Uh, writes about the, the, the seduction of the poster. Mm. So these are like these mm-hmm. full color posters inside yeah. in the city landscape as part of this metropolitan city landscape and the ways in which they're, they seductively attract us Mm-hmm. away and the way that that's mm-hmm. that that alienates us from our social from our from our more personal social life mm-hmm. i mean you see the same claims being made in the 1970s sure and, around video games it's like mm-hmm. oh now they're not gonna they're not gonna want to go play soccer mm-hmm. outside and it's always about the children right sure we don't yeah. instead yeah. they're going to want to play video games then it was about social media and oh they're not going to want to have real friends are going to be with these facebook's friends and then mm-hmm. now okay we'll project that into right. this this but thing but they've all been right to a certain extent well they've all it's been just transformative right? right so but mm-hmm. but that's the point too yeah. which is that mm-hmm. social life is not a static mm-hmm. thing social life um uh sociality itself extends to encompass so it's not a choice between the human and the technological. Mm-hmm. The VR environment and the meat space mm-hmm. environment. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, what gets produced is a kind of a hybrid experience where right. maybe those lines <clears throat> become more blurry or the line shifts, mm-hmm. like as they have with the cell phone. But right. that's the other thing, too. It's like whatever we think, whatever we pr- try to predict, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we're always somehow caught also unaware. It's true, right? Isn't right? that amazing? Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I was just listening to somebody talk uh, about, I think it was uh, Enrico Fermi um, at some point said that we were 50 years away from producing something like, uh, I don't know, a nuclear bomb or something like that. And then two years later, he's involved in the project to actually do it. Like, yeah, you right. know, it's like right. people that are closest to this sometimes thinks it's 50, 100 years away and it ends up being two years away. Mm-hmm. So where are we going to get caught off guard here? I mean, who knows? Who knows, yeah. right? I mean, I mean, I think of the mobile phone as such a great example because, you know, this idea of, I mean, why wouldn't somebody have thought about the the socio-technical networks of the mobile phone mm-hmm. and the ways in which they would impact upon social life and yeah. transform certain types of relationships. I mean, a guy named Mark Weiser writing in, in the 90s uh, mm-hmm. and, and created this amazing uh, ubiquitous computing project at mm-hmm. um, Xerox right. Park. Uh, built, they built <clears throat> uh, technologies that look very similar to the technologies that we have today. They mm-hmm. built, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, display screens uh, that were computationally activated mm. so that you could share knowledge and kind mm-hmm. of touch them and stuff. And they built tablets, which look like, which look remarkably like kind of very yeah. different uh, mm-hmm. iPads. And they built a thing called the pad or something like that that mm-hmm. looks a bit like a current mobile phone. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And, and Wiser predicted, you know, what are we going to need? We're going to need ubiquitous network tech 
ubiquitous, inexpensive network technology, cheap screens, and cheap computation. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was absolutely <clears throat> right about that. And then, but then he also predicted a whole set of use cases mm. around which those technologies would operate, and they are completely wrong. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So like, what? Yeah. And why is that? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it's actually because the people who build the technologies mm -hmm. are not trained right. in thinking about sociality and understanding yeah. or analyzing it. And the people who are, and equally, the people who are trained to think about sociality and yeah. predict and, and be critical about those things yeah. don't know anything about or know very little about the technologies. It's true. And it's a totally different kind of a mindset and approach to understanding as well. Whereas one seems to be more about reduction and uh, understanding things in their parts and then rebuilding it. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other one is, uh, I mean, I got to say sociality or what, what you want to call that is, is a lot more complex in some ways. Seems so it's to, really hard to pin down into a, uh, into a framework. And, you know, yeah. It's qualitative. It's yeah. interpretivist. I mean, so you, you look at the university mm -hmm. and it makes sense, right? Why we have the, the disciplines that make things <clears throat> and study the, the built mm -hmm. environment, uh, the natural sciences, the engineering fields over on one side of campus. Then we have the humanities and the social sciences kind of somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, and, it mm -hmm. seems that these are different types of knowledge, and it seems like, uh, and and it, and I think we've also naturalized the idea that it's different types of people. Mm -hmm. That you have there's a sociology type mm -hmm. of person, mm -hmm. and there is a computer science type of person, and that we track them and move them in and out of those. Yeah, and areas. we even talk about them as left brain, right brain. Left type, brain, right you know, brain. We naturalize kind of, them. Yeah. We talk about biological mm -hmm. components. Mm -hmm. But it, again, you know, let's go back. Who benefits? Mm -hmm. Who benefits when we think about the think about it that way. Um, but also, who would benefit, I think, if we figured out ways to re-merge re mm -hmm. or move across those divides, which is, I think, why, what's happening right now, why so many people are mm. thinking about things like ethics and computer science. And right. If you go mm -hmm. on the popular media, or privacy, mm -hmm. or surveillance, right. or all these, these themes are so present in our media environment now, and yet we're somehow... We find it difficult, I think, to really think through that stuff through mm. because of this divide between the social and the technical. <clears throat> and and now we have to now we have to solve these problems right. by, by by putting those things back together. Mm -hmm. Does this? <clears throat> I mean, we're we're kind of talking about what what the popular narratives tends to be something about risk and danger and that sort of thing. Um, so we're in, in essence we're talking about optimism or pessimism for the future in, in, in some basic way. Um, I tend to be, despite a lot of the signals uh, that I see, a little pro optimistic. optimistic. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Me you too. Know, despite you know rationally thinking certain steps through and extrapolating and saying, well, if this keeps going, it's going to be like this for sure in uh -huh. 10, 12 years. Like, you know, uh -huh. but then somehow we find corrections, uh, you know, and different social factors come into play, which you know throw that uh, thing into a spiral, and uh, it, it ends up being something different altogether. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, I think the, the dichotomy between the uh, utopic and the dystopic mm -hmm. is a very yeah, bad, you know, use, useless yeah. one, really. Mm -hmm. I, I, in fact, I, <laughs> it's why I went uh, to do a PhD. So I was working mm -hmm. as a platform engineer in a high-tech company. Oh, I forgot uh, that. Well, a yeah. digital, mm -hmm. telephony, digital telephony company right. in, the, in the 90s. This is just as the internet was kind of coming on mm -hmm. um, in 94, 95. Uh, and uh, I was so struck by the conversations that I was reading about this new technology, mm. the Internet, and how you, you had one guy talking about silicon, mm -hmm. silicon snake oil, and it was all, you know, this was going to ruin the world and destroy the world. And then you had these other people doing exactly the, the reverse arguments. Mm. It was a utopic, dystopic. I was like, there's, mm -hmm. I mean, and I was embedded in this tech these technologies, I, I was building them and understanding them. And I knew that those, both, both of those positions were completely wrong. Right. So I went back to school because I wanted to try to figure out and navigate some kind of terrain through that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, but I agree with you. I'm, uh, mm -hmm. I'm much more optimistic, uh, yeah. or I should say, I'm not, I try not to be too romantic about mm -hmm. the past. Yeah. Well, definitely. Preservation. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the, yeah, that, that seems to be uh, a thing for a lot of people is that, uh, you know, the solution to a lot of problems is just to go back to the way things were, <laughs> yeah. some kind of a false utopian Exactly. Uh, you know, yeah. it's like, it's like mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to opt out of these systems by not using my cell phone. Right. right. 
Yeah. Well, you know, fine, but you're mm-hmm. still interpolated within these broader social, Absolutely. socio-technical yeah. systems. You know, mm-hmm. uh, there's a fascinating example of this recently where, a couple of years ago now, where a guy said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you put in a smart meter, an electrical mm-hmm. smart meter mm-hmm. into my home. Uh, I don't want you monitoring my right. power u- usage right. in this kind of digital format. But of course, you know, so opting out, mm-hmm. you know, he's still interpolated within that system. You know, oh, he's yeah. a black spot within it, but he's still yeah. kind of, uh, so the system that then manages when electricity, the yeah. loads and things like that, he's still yeah. subject to that. That's true, right? Monitoring yeah. and, mm-hmm. and stuff. He's not at the individual level, but he's still beholden to that system. So mm-hmm. there is no opting out. Uh, and so the kind of romantic, like, oh, you know. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to go pretty far. Yeah. Well, I mean, this reminds me of uh, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. People of that mindset, you know, who uh, reduce everything down to a danger and then by extrapolating into the future. And then as a result, we need to go back to nature. Yeah. Uh, and, that, and isolate yeah. ourselves. Right. Right. Um, I mean, I guess it could work depending on what your goals are. If your goals are to be like a primitive person in the woods, maybe it might. <laughs> but I mean, is that really what we want from life and, uh, and humanity? I don't know. I mean, I think it's an absolutely legitimate mm. personal strategy. And right. For example, I don't mm. use Facebook, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But I, I, that's a personal thing. I have no, I don't see that as an oppositional move. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't create mm-hmm. an alternative political outcome no. No. by doing that. And so it's not a, it's not, I, I think of those choices for myself anyway, they're not protest votes. No. They're personal choices that I make uh, with, within a, a framework that I try to operate within. But Definitely. they're not, they're yeah. not, they're, they, they don't, they're not um, interventions into the system. No, and, and that's the reason that I've been on Facebook a lot less. It's mainly because of personal stress levels. It's just a lot, uh, you know, who needs all that that uh, noise? Mm. Uh, but on the other hand, I can I can kind of, understand that way of thinking in that if enough people did it then something you know would change and so they're kind of living by example and trying to you know project that idea normatively into the world and saying well i'm doing this you know and look it's good for me and then maybe everybody will copy it and then the world would be a better place which is another strategy of people normatively yeah. i like that i mean mm-hmm. I, I i think i agree with that well, mm-hmm. but in, but doing that strategy is uh, a, a additional or an add add on to the initial strategy of of rejection of the system so mm-hmm. just by rejecting the system right. you do not no. do that second normative step so That's if, true. In, but but many people who do opt out then claim that second Mm. part but they don't actually do that second part right and that's the that's that's a bit hypocritical Mm -hmm. i find i find that part of it hypocritical so yeah so in the early 90s you left the the world of what call it business yeah into the world of academia i kind of went the reverse right around the same time i was in (laughs) academia and in the early 90s i went into business home computing right i think you were (laughs) well it was the uh when the newton was first coming out from apple Mm -hmm. so uh i uh made a deal with apple and i opened up a chain of computer stores that specialized in uh, apple newtons and then we got into the uh, u.s robotics palm pilots when they came out Mm -hmm. and uh, hp was coming out with some handheld devices yeah, things like that. And we were doing wire, we we're developing wireless email with Motorola. And then, of course, RIM kind of leapfrogged past us and uh, went, uh, we know where they went with that. Um, so, and it's funny, you were just saying, and around that time when I did, when I was a philosophy graduate student and then thought, well, this is too exciting to just leave, leave alone what's happening. And, and one of the things that... Um, uh, brought me to that was basically just extrapolating the technologies. I was just seeing that, okay, well, Apple just came out with this thing. It wasn't even released yet, and I knew some programmers who uh, had got some early copies of this uh, device. And you could see that, well, you know, this is going to be kind of interesting. As the screens get thinner and lighter and cheaper and the uh, software gets better, it's just going to be amazing. And, then, you know, then we have the the iPhone, of course. Um but Steve Jobs was actually the person who kind of stalled that uh, in a way, because when he came back to Apple, he ditched the entire Newton division mm-hmm. and anything else that wasn't invented while he was there. Mm-hmm. So as a result, I think uh, this kind of technology was kind of delayed for a few years. And then the, the iPod started to back up again, where they started having these tiny computing devices that can do everything for you, including recognize. Yeah. You yeah. Know, I mean, I, I don't know if it's so much, I mean, I, I, mm. I've thought a lot about this mm. actually, cause I see those, those things are the initial pervasive. Those mm. are, those are initial pervasive computing devices, right. particularly the, uh, the, uh, 
the wirelessly the, the, oh, enabled yeah. Palm Pilot yes. type stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was involved in a project using HP Jornadas mm. uh, when I first started, when I was still doing my PhD. Uh, that had had early wireless cards and right. so these the devices PCMCIA were, cards. They were they were actually yeah. mobile wireless computers. That's what we're working uh, on. Yeah. And we didn't have cell phones. Cell phones didn't mm -hmm. do that then, right? They, cell phones were phones. They didn't. Mm -hmm. have, they weren't. There were no smartphones. So um, my sense is that in fact it wasn't it wasn't Newton closing down mm -hmm. uh, that that slowed it all. It uh, it was almost like what really got it all going was the iPod, as you say, but yeah. it wasn't the hardware of the iPod. No. It was the integration. Right, right. It was the, because there were lots of amazing mm -hmm. actual music players at that time period. And in fact, the iPod was a remarkably right. bad one at the, in the first days, yeah. right? But it was so tightly integrated into iTunes. Yeah. And, it, and that movement between your computer, which is now online and the device, which you're carrying with you and, and the transactional mm -hmm. ways that those things that worked, like that was a sea change. And it was, it, that's what, so that drove, that use case of music really mm -hmm. drove the creation of these now increasingly pervasive tied together devices. Mm -hmm. And that's what drove, that's mm -hmm. what's continued to drive, you know, right. um, including to some degree the smartphone, I mm -hmm. think. I mean, there's something about the smartphone gets the, the iPod somehow generates the smartphone. Right. Yeah. I mean, they're all, obviously we don't mean to think uh, in terms of like a direct cause and effect for these things, no. but all of these are, are factors and some of them are more uh, impactful than others, but uh, there's kind of the swirl of activity that yeah. leads. Yeah. But it's the integration and it's this, mm -hmm. it's the, the thing that Apple did so well in that was thought really long and hard about how one moved between devices mm -hmm. and the kinds of experiences people had on these different devices and they, mm -hmm. and they thought across the ecosystem. Um, and, and in fact, you know, that, the other thing they did was they made these deals with these mm -hmm. music providers. Right. That's, the, that's in the backdrop to mm -hmm. all of this, the, the, how difficult and how contentious mm -hmm. those technologies <clears throat> were and the work that uh, Jobs and, and Apple had to do in order to get the content out of these out of these mm -hmm. other systems and into those systems. Right. Like, so if you look at these technologies, I and mean, I think this is where, you know, I, I think we really have to do more work. It's, it's when you look at successful technologies or unsuccessful ones, mm -hmm. or ones that, have that are successful and have bad, <laughs> you know, social Outcomes. input, yeah. you know, you, we have to understand them as socio-technical systems mm -hmm. that are multi-sided that involve institutions and economics and yes. all this stuff mm -hmm. and this the current model that we have of thinking of technologies as you know mm -hmm. a technology and a human these kind mm -hmm. of micro transactional mm -hmm. accounts of that mm -hmm. absolutely insufficient mm -hmm. for both from a critical point of view for thinking about yeah. what these impacts are going to be but yeah. also from a creative point of view about mm -hmm. where the innovations will be Right. But I mean, you, you, it sounds like you're kind of pointing to that division in terms of uh, approach that we were just talking about a minute ago in terms of like the engineering mindset versus like a sociologist mindset or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm and they're remarkably often... on message. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and, and, and you know, again, with people like uh, we like characters like Ted Kaczynski or someone like that, we're just uh, focused on so much of the, you know, let's call it optimization or efficiency or that sort of approach to, to things, then uh, you might miss a lot of the other social factors and all these other uh, yeah. swirling activities that are happening around them. The scale, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it, my work these days primarily focuses on, on the, the problem of scale, thinking mm. about how design is a profession or computer science is a discipline or my own discipline disciplines. Mm. Um, uh, uh, scale the site of analysis. So one of the problems that I often f often see with certain types of design, um, and design as a field is attempting to address, is the is that microtransactional mm. format. Where so user experience design is a really interesting example mm. of this, where um, it brings the human back into the design equation, which mm -hmm. is fabulous, right? Mm -hmm. Particularly if you're moving from a context where the human is dropped out of that right. context, right? Yeah. So it brings the human back in. But it makes the assumption that the human is a is a liberal human subject. If you mm. remember that terminology mm. from your <laughs> philosophy yeah. thing, uh, an autonomous agent, unbound mm -hmm. by convention mm -hmm. or physicality or anything, able to make its decisions. It's an ideal form. Ideal form, 
But yeah. and and then it designs and then it designs for that. Where, mm -hmm. As if the technology is sitting there and the human is sitting Correct. there and the human acts independently of everything mm -hmm. else. What certain types of design, service design, and things like that have been thinking more about it, broadening the scale of analysis to mm. include social context, human relations, institutions, and things like that. And I mm -hmm. find that very um, uh, hopeful, you mm -hmm. know, because I think that's where that's where we really have to get to is where we're thinking about these things as systems mm -hmm. that are hybrid. <clears throat> yes, that are both human and non-human. Mm -hmm. across social scale, individualistic, cultural, institutional. The better we can do that, the better chances yeah. we have. Yeah, human-centered uh, design. We, I mean, we know a lot of uh, people in that design thinking world. Uh, uh, we have some friends in common, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And there's always, I, I've started noticing lately, there's kind of a backlash to that even. Uh, a lot of people are saying, enough with the design, <laughs> human-centered thinking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, we, we had yeah. a project recently that was about... Um, uh, uh, designing for non-humans. Interesting. Uh, okay. It started, we never quite completed it, but mm. you know, we started it and it was, the idea was how would you design a city for the non-human residents? Like Uber cars, like self-driving no, like, cars? What do you mean? Like, yeah. uh, kit foxes and, mm, um, I see. Okay. I don't know, peregrine falcons right. and things like that. Well, I that's mean, not, yeah. Sometimes people do do that. I mean, there mm -hmm. are design elements in some of the skyline of new york city that have been designed explicitly for peregrine falcons nice super interesting yeah right? so what happens when you re mm -hmm. when you decenter the human within these yeah. things is you open up new yeah. p potential new inputs for um for that's thinking, very right? true right i mean it seems like if you take that to the limit and design everything for the human it seems kind of destined for disaster in a way because you do like you say fail to take into account maybe the natural environment around mm -hmm. you for example or uh, yeah other or, systems or right? or if you do, do that design for the human as if human as if culture mm. or society itself is simply an aggregate of individual humans right you're really missing a lot right, right? because yeah. there are these superhuman Emergent patterns, emergent maybe. Emergent mm. systems in yeah. play, of which mm. you could kind of consider culture one, mm -hmm. that should also be taken into account. Hmm. Um, so it sounds like we're kind of optimistic about what's, uh, what's, what's around the corner. Um, how are we doing for time? Let's check. Yeah. We're doing good. Yeah, we're good. Now, I don't typically, uh, you know what, I'm gonna, since we took a break, can I take a bathroom break? Do you stop recording, or should I just Sometimes keep talking? You can, if you like. <laughs> Fly me to the, the moon and let me roll. Keep singing. That's great. Oh, you're singing. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Pomodoros, or whatever they call it. Oh, yeah. You heard about that? No. What's that? You break up your day into these. What are they? What are they called? Pom tomatoes. Oh, tomatoes. Yeah, I don't. I don't understand. Pomodori. I don't quite understand it. <laughs> Interesting. I guess we're still rolling. Yeah, perfect. So maybe I mean we're talking a lot about stuff, but what about personal stuff? Like, uh, how's it going? What, I mean, the last time I see, mm. saw you, you were you just had a baby. I I've had two since. So wow. yeah. So my oldest daughter. Mm -hmm turned seven Holy shit. on uh, yeah i know on, <laughs> on, on friday yeah um and my youngest daughter's five hmm. so in fact one of the reasons why we, i can't stay too long here right. today is because my youngest daughter sasha is uh appearing in a in her class play at hmm. four o'clock hmm. all the way in lee side so oh, i gotta right. get all the oh, way over yeah. there yeah um uh, she is the cat and the fiddle. <laughs> awesome. she, she has an amazing line too, and I yeah. uh, she does it great. So her first line is, "Hey, no, it's it's I'm the cat and the fiddle. No, it's Hey, I'm the cat and the fiddle. My cow keeps jumping over the moon." <laughs> and she says it just like that. So her she's a little that tiny awesome. little five year old, my cow keeps jumping over the moon. That is awesome. Oh, so that's going well. Yeah. So raising two children, th is it three now? No, just two. Two. two right? That's it. Um, you know, I sometimes joke sometimes uh, with, with friends that uh, raising a child is kind of like developing an AI. In a way. <laughs> you know, in a kind of a slow, deep learning way. In a, in a less, much more autonomous and much more effectual, yeah. much less effectual kind of a way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can't, I'm, I'm having difficulty <laughs> correlating the uh, experience of yeah. using Google TensorFlow and the experience <laughs> of raising. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I guess the, uh, the parallel there would be... Uh, 
uh, both uh, actions could potentially engage you in a kind of a self-reflection on right. what you think value, what, what, what are your values, what you what mm -hmm. you think about cognition and things like that. Right, sure, right, right, sure, because you kind of step outside yourself because you're dealing with that uh, kind a of little abstract version. layer. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, it's really interesting. I, mm. um, though it's funny because I have, I have had colleagues who uh, use the experience of raising a child as a, as a kind of a theoretic prompt. Right. You know, so, you know, maybe they're involved in cognitive science or some kind of a field and they think mm -hmm. about that or, or early childhood education, you know. Uh, I just try to witness it as best I can. And I, mm -hmm. I really try to just, you know, sort of disengage that theoretic mind sure. uh, and just enjoy the whole experience. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a whole so different part of you that's... Uh, this is what I've been kind of noticing and I've been talking a lot about during the podcasts uh, as well. It's kind of... I mean, as I said to you before we started, this is kind of like a therapy for me as well. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like... Uh, uh, it's a study of the self, but also myself in a way. And... Uh, I always come across uh, notions about artificial intelligence when thinking about the self, because many reasons why, obviously, because, I mean, we're, we're talking about intelligent agents uh, that, in our case, develop over millions of years of whatever processes on this planet and uh, repeated cycles that tend to repeat more successful ones and, uh, you know reiterations of millions and millions and millions of time, eventually certain patterns of behavior form. And then, you know, larger perspective of that we call, you know, like evolutionary theory or whatever. But is there something deeper? Like what is it about something that wants to persist or move forward? Or like what I'm saying is, is there something deeper that explains an evolutionary framework? Is there something in information that you noticed where it flows a certain way, like entropy or something? Or, you know, there's this notion that information wants to be free, for example. Are there proclivities in information that mirror the proclivities that we see in nature, for example? Well, yeah. I mean, again, again, you know, what you're deploying here is nature is a theory itself, right? right? In fact, yeah. in fact, evolutionary <clears throat> theory is an information theory right. as much that's as what it's anything yeah. else. So that's what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> um, I don't think it's yeah. nature so much. I don't know. I, uh, I, I increasingly have difficulty with those kinds of questions mm. in, in part because I guess that I would always respond. I, I will respond to that with an, with another question is like, which is, you know, how will, answering that question or engaging in mm -hmm. the kind of questioning process that that question demands mm -hmm. help you activate, engage mm -hmm. in a kind of a, in your life. It might. No, no. But see, on, yeah. So for mm -hmm. me, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I guess I'm increasingly pragmatic. Like mm -hmm. I, for me, I don't, I don't, I mm -hmm. can't quite deal with things at that level. Right. Um, uh, I, I'm more, I'm more interested. I'm actually, I guess I'd say, Rather than, I've been moving away from a more philosophic point of view, I guess I'd put it mm -hmm. that way, mm -hmm. and towards more of a pragmatic interventionist view. Mm -hmm. So for me, the theory and the, the, those, the, the reflexivity is present for me right mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. um, as a way to help me intervene more productively in society. Right. Right. So you asked me a minute ago, for example, like what, personally, what I've, what I've been doing. And mm -hmm. so... You know, you might know, you might remember, I have always engaged in this thing called critical making, which mm. is a term that I kind of defined right. a number of years ago. Basically, it was a very simplistic perspective. It mm. was that to resolve the divide between the social and the technical, the divide between, they say, the computer science and the sociology, uh, um, technical practices of hands-on work mm -hmm. connected to theoretic examination Mm -hmm. would, in fact, um, give us added capacity to, mm -hmm. to think more productively about society and technology. Yes. So that was my, that has been my project <clears throat> ever <clears throat> since. Um, very academic project, very mm -hmm. much around like how, what are the theories by which one would, practices and theories by which one would, would do this work? Mm -hmm. um, what is the problem, what are the problems with the current theoretic apparatus that people are deploying? Mm -hmm. I defined in terms like textual mm -hmm. doppelgangers and things like that. Right. Nowadays, I'm like, okay, fine. So I think I, I think personally, I've got a bit of a bit of a handle on what that looks like, how mm -hmm. I can do that. Mm -hmm. 
And now I wanted to play that. And so uh, in, in, not in terms of writing articles, mm. but in terms of creating material interventions, hmm. technical, socio-technical interventions. Right. So a couple of years ago, I got involved in a project uh, with a large uh, NGO uh, called CBM Canada, uh, a, couple, a couple of hospitals in the developing world, in particular one called Corsu in Uganda. And we began to develop a infrastructure for the 3D printing of prosthetics. Awesome. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So that started in 2014. We did, a, we did a pilot in 2015. We did a longer clinical trial that ran up until October of last year. We raised money from Grand Challenges mm. Canada and Google and Autodesk and all these people. And, you know, on the surface, that looks like an, a very instrumental project mm. of, you know, there are these patients that don't have lower limb prosthetics, mobility mm -hmm. prosthetics, that's what we're interested in. Um, we're going to build a technology that facilitates access to them. But, and it is that, for sure it's that. But it's also, for me, an attempt to broaden that scale and think more comprehensively about the way these technologies fit into social life. And we've designed <clears throat> the technologies around a series of values mm. that are that are really about integrating the social and the technical. So for example, mm -hmm. we, the whole thing is made to be operated by prosthetists in the local context, because we have this mm. idea that it's not enough. If you, it's not enough to just solve the problems of the patients. Right. If in mm. fact you're disempowering a set of clinical providers, makes sense, right? Because that's yeah. non-sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. So we very closely studied and looked at, you know, the provision of, uh, these devices, and we wanted to develop a series of technologies that provide the, the, the ultimate output to the patient, but also <clears throat> upskill and add capacity to the clinical population. Among other things, giving them new capacity to communicate their work hmm. to other clinical people that are that's engaged great. in care, right? Yeah. So that's me trying, mm -hmm. taking mm -hmm. what started as a critical making project, actually, a thing yep. called DIY Prosthetics, mm -hmm. a series of workshops. So we did some of which we did actually right. in the, the foundry, foundry space, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. foundry building. Mm -hmm. um, the first ones were done there, and then we, this, the rest were done at U of T. And say, okay, I could write a paper about it, and, I, and we did a uh, few papers about it, but we can take those learnings and use them to pragmatically deploy a solution in the world. Now, the problem with that, of course, is it, that does not fit nicely into mm. a scholastic context. No? No, because the yeah, projects are very long-term. Right. And uh, it's slow work, and there's all sorts of pieces to this that have nothing to do with the... Mm -hmm. they, they, don't, they don't result in papers. There's very mundane right. bits right. and pieces. But, you know, for me, that's, that's, the, that's the trajectory, right? Right. Which is... Yeah. Starting way back in that utopic, dystopic, you know, oh, this language is so bad. Oh, we need to understand these things using a more sophisticated register. Then it's like, okay, we, now I'm starting to kind of understand this stuff. What good is understanding it if, it's right. not, if you're not intervening? It's great that you're doing this. Do you think others in your field or realm are thinking like you do? Or is this something, you know, that's somewhat unusual these days? Because I, I tend to think of maybe it's a stereotype I have that... Uh, a lot of this type of research is maybe driven a lot by, well, first of all, let's call it the engineering mindset without regard to the social implications. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. second, it's also driven often by corporate, uh, you know, donations or whatever direction or, or uh, you know, or, or the success of it is often uh, decided on whether or not something is created as a result of it that could then eventually be taken to market, for example. So that kind of thing is happening. And, and when that is happening, I guess the incentive structures aren't in place for to do some of the things that you're doing. But what you're describing is also the academic world isn't really mm -hmm. that into mm -hmm. it. That's right. That's right. Well, I mean, I, yeah. I would say that a lot of this is, it's not so much that those things are oppositional. So mm -hmm potential market, blah, blah, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I could say this in two different ways. So one way is it's not oppositional. In fact, you could see the ways in which market possibilities sure. could, for, for could example, yeah. produce better, <laughs> sus more sustainable, you know, so it starts with phil philanthropy and moves to mm -hmm. market. Um, that's, that's probably the, the optimistic way of saying it. The, mm -hmm. the somewhat less optimistic way of saying that is in order to create these kinds of projects, one must make those claims. Mm one must translate one's philanthropic right. or social goals into ways that resonate, for example, for market forces. And we, of course, have done yeah. those translations. <clears throat> but I do think the bigger, not the bigger issue, but, it, but a, another issue there is, uh, yeah, the kind of um, difficulty 
in doing this kind of work legitimately within uh, more humanistic mm. forms. Uh, but but yeah. actually many other forms, because again, yeah, the, the commitment is much longer than one, than an academic project mm -hmm. uh, and involves all sorts of work that academics are poorly trained for. Well, I'm lucky because I don't do a lot of that. We have a CEO that, uh, and other, you know, there's an organization now to kind oh, of nice. do that, yep. but getting mm -hmm. to the point where there's an organization is not a, is not a very easy, easy task, but, um, mm. uh, I don't, and I don't know if the university should be the site for that stuff. To right. Tell you the I truth. wonder. Maybe it's yeah. adjacent. <clears throat> uh, you know, I've been thinking recently uh, about having children. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I just turned 50, so it's kind of late. It's okay. <laughs> I was, I was uh, well, I was 43 when oh, yeah, I had wow. my first one, so I'm about yeah. to turn 52. So. Awesome. Um, and uh, it's something that I, I, I keep thinking about and uh, in, in spurts, you know, like one year I'll be convinced of it's a great idea and, you know, maybe it changes daily, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm with a woman these days that it's a possibility. So, um, and I like to ask my friends, you know, <laughs> what that experience sure, was like. Sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I mean, from a simply, uh, I'm going to be very... Uh, egoistic in, hmm. in this context you know if you don't have kids then you never had kids right and there is uh there is something about that relationship that is not reproducible mm -hmm. in other any other type of relationship mm -hmm. so if you don't have kids then you don't have that experience right i mean yeah for better or for worse right right so and if you're the kind of person <laughs> that is um, an experience collector mm. That's mm. one. That's a, that's an egoistic reason. It right? is, and it's a long term trip. It is a long term <laughs> trip. But the nice thing is that you keep having novel experiences yeah, right. throughout it. So that's it's true. not like that. It's a gift that keeps yeah. on giving, so to yeah. speak, right? That's like I, LSD is twelve hours, but you know, rearing like a child years, is like yeah, yeah decades. Well, uh, until you die, <laughs> right? Right, until you die. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I love I love uh, mm. my girls, and I love my wife. I. I love the whole experience of it, and I, right. uh, I, I think it's an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, it seems like, I mean, we're talking about, I mean, we're, we're, we're embodied human creatures that have this kind of a prime directive in a way to <laughs> recreate ourselves in some form, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's physical or sometimes it's translated into the theoretical as well. I mean, a lot of you know, artists would tell you that their creations are in a, in a similar way, kind of tickling that same kind of, uh, you know, directive to create something, to put it out into the world. That's part of it, I'm sure. But, mm -hmm. but all the things that basically were, uh, what, what I, I tend to kind of just simplistically narrow down all these, uh, investigations that I'm doing essentially is, mm -hmm. as basically two questions, really. It's like, what the fuck is going on and how should I live? You know, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I can't really answer all the questions of what the fuck is going on because you'll never get an answer to that. That's complete enough that, uh, so you have to go by, you know, limited information mm -hmm. and, uh, and how do we live? Um, you know, this gets to is, you know, what's best for me might not be also what's uh, best for everybody. So we were talking earlier about like these normative, uh, positions to take based on, you know, I think this is great for me, therefore everyone should do it. You know, that kind of a thing. But uh, it doesn't always work, but that's how we kind of communicate these ideas to each other, uh, you know, through talk, through pressure, through all yeah, kinds of things. Yeah, that's true. You know? I, I mean, uh, so if this was a, uh, if, I, if I was having a, uh, a meeting with a PhD student, for mm. example, I'd say you need to properly scope your questions. Right. Um, but uh, <laughs> I don't think that's what you want to necessarily hear. But, you know, mm. the, the question of how do I live, I mean, I do mm. think that that's a central question. Yeah. Not, not necessarily what the fuck's going on, but how do I live? Mm -hmm. um, I think letting the how do I live now, mm -hmm. not forever, but right. now, mm -hmm. drive the what the fuck is going on exactly. yeah. is a really good way to properly scope these questions. So mm -hmm. one looks you know, very pragmatically at the decisions one needs to make mm -hmm. and then lets that drive the data gathering. The, yeah. But, but, you know, one thing you do are, are taught, you know, when you do a master of arts or, uh, mm -hmm. uh, part of a PhD or all of a PhD <laughs> right. is, you know, um, how to design a research project. Mm -hmm. And I will say, I think that is a great skill yeah. for everyone yeah. is how do you design your project? And I think, PhDs 
learn something about that. Um, that's scho- great scholars, advice. Scholars learn yeah. something about that. That's great advice. I don't think I learned that in grad school as I should have, and that's why I probably left. I uh, didn't. So <laughs> truthfully, I didn't learn it as much in grad school as I could have. Yeah. I've learned it more through witnessing the trials and tribulations of students mm-hmm. And, yeah. and and seeing the successes of those that do that well, and the and the the more uh, complex process mm-hmm. of those that don't, and thinking back in my own processes and thinking, you know, the one thing that I've never been very good at is research design. Yeah, research mm-hmm. methodology is a completely thing. Research design. Mm-hmm. So that's something I I now mm-hmm. have kind of tasked myself with, is better design. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's great advice. It, it seems maybe I'm, I'm not right about this, but it seems harder to apply that to philosophy, for example, because it's not concrete in any sense. <laughs> I mean, it's really hard to define a research project for me. It was I'm speaking mm-hmm. personally. Um, because every time you kind of open up a question, it leads to other questions and think, oh, that would be a great thesis or that could be a great essay. And then, you know, you just never really get anywhere, uh, because there's just too much going on. But that's more of a personal cognitive issue I have because I, I tend to, and uh, I think you're absolutely right about that. I need to have, you know, what did you call it? The focus, uh, re- <laughs> Yeah, let the let the uh, uh, question, Quite, what the fuck is going on, be right. driven by what am I trying, what, how do I want to live right. now? Right. Now, but yeah. I think it's an inter, it's kind of a feedback loop, yeah, though, right? Sure, it's sure. yeah, and it's never one or the other. And this is the thing I'm I'm kind of uh, realizing about myself is that uh, I think a lot of people do in one metaphor or another is that we are multiples inside us. Mm-hmm, it's not really mm-hmm. like a singular entity. Mm-hmm. For this sure. notion of the self has been maybe since the Enlightenment, maybe since Descartes, this idea of this like this entity that's kind of there directing I think everything. Therefore, I am. Yeah, you know? yeah. No, you don't. You no. am because you think, or <laughs> some say that. other yeah. complex. Really, I'm right. thinking because I was. I don't know. You mm-hmm. know, like, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I, mm-hmm. I, um, the multiple bodies. I mean, the, the interesting, mm-hmm. you know, something that I use, um, uh, hopefully productively. Mm-hmm. I find the notion of the contradiction to be the really, the valuable. That's move, awesome. Yeah. Right? I was just, yeah. It's like, it's, it's, so when you reconstitute, you reconstitute yourself as multiple mm-hmm. rather than imagine yourself as singular mm-hmm. and think about those multiple, multi, that multiplicity mm-hmm. sometimes in contradiction. Right. Of course. And yeah. then isolating and being able to be clear about what those contradictions are. Mm-hmm. I think that's a very productive thing. Not, not with the goal of result necessarily resolving the sure. contradiction. Yeah. But yeah. how to live well through all of that yeah, uh, because interplay? Because yeah. we are. I mean, that's mm-hmm. the complex. The complexity is not of mm-hmm. life. Is mm-hmm. not no. a simplistic. Di- oh, we just need to identify the opportunity and then move. Yeah. You know, it's actually there are these multiple opportunities. They position me in contradiction to myself. Mm-hmm. How do I move forward despite that? And by yeah. the way, to go back to the beginning of our conversation, mm. the difference between that multiple self model and that more rationalistic yeah. kind of choice. That's also where AI yes. failed. Yes. And uh, and the newer yeah. moves of AI are sort of embracing mm-hmm. s- stuff like convolutional learning network stuff. That's that true. These right? technologies yeah. are embracing multiplicity. It's one of the big changes. Well, one of the, uh, you know, when I was in grad school doing my PhD and what I left to go into basically technology business, um, one of the last essays that I, I remember writing uh, was... Um, about AI th- mm. through a Heidegger's, uh, Heideggerian perspective. And, Phenomenological. Yeah. yeah. And, and basically my, my approach was, well, we're never really going to get a human-like intelligence that's, you know, adequately similar to ours unless we let it live. Unless we let it be embodied. Yeah, 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 embodied. It has to have some care of its own embodied existence in some sense. It has to have some kind of a context within which it's it's operating and it's learning through experience because you know like like i said earlier yeah. kind of facetiously about children being like ai yeah. i mean we let them make mistakes and learn mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. but we're not we don't let ais really make important mistakes uh you know we can't well, how sometimes. could they yeah exactly. right uh, yeah. that's the so it's fascinating you say that because mm-hmm. one of my uh, phd students dan southwick is doing this mm-hmm. amazing work on uh the cultural history of computer-aided design and human creativity found this amazing quote, which I think I had missed in hmm. reading Turing. Oh, yeah? What was it? Turing has a, a, a theory, Alan Turing, right? Mm-hmm. You know, kind of one sure. of the founders of modern computing, about embodied computing. Wow. And yeah. it's exactly that yeah. theory. It's like yeah. computers can never yeah. evoke 
real, what we would consider human intelligence yeah. until they're somehow embodied. Right, right. And so, and as an, because of that's so difficult, he creates this much more restrictive mm. processes, which is known as the Turing test, which right. is a disembodied, Very narrow. Yeah. disembodied mm. narrow line of communication. Yeah, mm -hmm. because he thinks that's actually doable within mm -hmm. the realm of computing. Mm -hmm. But it's a fascinating move to say, you know, embodiment is the kind of site of intelligence rather mm -hmm. than some kind of like the body oh, yeah. is simply an instrumental tool that the brain uses to move. Oh, itself I think the we've world. got that. Yeah. Very wrong. And, and I'm glad to hear someone in your realm talk about this oh, yeah. in that way, I guess. Is, is that typical or, or because I, I, well, there's, there's, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. so there has been a move mm -hmm. uh, in the last 20 years or so, maybe more towards uh, theories of embodiment, mm -hmm. cognition, intelligence, mm -hmm. information, yeah. Um, there's been, uh, in fact, you could even consider th there's th some people have considered there to be a third wave of computers of, uh, sorry, cognitive science mm. that basically is the move to the embodied. Yeah. And what's gotta be what yeah. I find fascinating about that too, uh, is the way in which many of the theories and perspectives of that class of computer science literature looks a lot like uh, some of the foundational texts, theories from mm. the foundational texts of science and technology studies or science studies. So right. the work of people like Donna Haraway mm. or feminist theories of situated knowledges made mm -hmm. by people like Sandra Harding. Right. Like you're reading this cognitive science stuff coming from a completely different point of view and yet it's making claims about the situated mm -hmm. embodied as the, as the real site. It's like, wait, I just read that in, you know, Absolutely. this yeah. feminist... Mm -hmm. This really feminist, materialist, uh, Marxist kind of work. It's, it's not like interesting. There's amazing. a lot of cross-fertilization possibilities no, it's, there. But it's not. See, that's the ah. interesting thing. Mm. Completely disconnected, coming at those ideas from their own disciplinary background, but right. not necessarily finding the... Oh, I see. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but I'm mm -hmm. sure people are starting to do that. But mm -hmm. fascinating, yeah. Mm -hmm. Embodied computing, great. <laughs> well, uh, I know you're, you're short for time. We're going to... How short for time are you? I should leave in okay. like five minutes. Okay, we'll do it in five minutes. I just wanted to ask you quickly about uh, I, I, one of the previous episodes. I, I talked a little bit about this competition they had between uh, Go, the game of Go player playing against, uh, yeah. you know, the uh, computer deep yeah. loop. Yeah. And uh, I watched that documentary about it, and it seemed to me that, um, see, there's an example of we're letting something learn on its own. So essentially what it's doing is it's kind of simulating games with itself. And, uh, and and learning how to be a better Go player. But I'm wondering if we have like simulation VR type technology, are we going to let an AI experience social interactions with other you know entities to get better? Like what we're talking about, well, children living through the world and so, living. So yeah. they did do that. I mean, yeah. so, so uh, some of the uh, text, text bots, mm. uh, the, the AI text bots ha use exactly those strategies for, and s same with things like Siri and, and mm -hmm. stuff like that, use those strategies to develop and expand their vocabulary, so to speak, right. or to mm -hmm. find new patterns of interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with that is you, you sometimes get these unexpected hmm. outcomes, like when the Microsoft bot, I forget what it was mm. now, I think it was Microsoft, started spouting racist. <laughs> Do you remember that? Do you remember yeah, hearing about that? examples like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, I mean, right. So, again, mm. we're back to this issue mm -hmm. of risk yeah. and danger. Mm -hmm. Because, yes, so self-learning and that kind of learning through that kind of maybe uh, computationally yeah. accelerated mm -hmm. social interaction form yeah. is probably a very powerful one. But it's also a bit... Um, Un indirect and sure. risky in yeah. the same way that you know you you send your kid to school and they come back doing <laughs> it's me. True, right? I mean, my kids have not done that. Sorry <laughs> to say that, but um, to feel the need to say that, but uh, you know, it's like yeah. So, what type of risk are mm. we going to allow mm. these systems to experience, and 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 how do we do it in a way that is um, not too risky for us? Like, yeah. you wouldn't necessarily want an AI that's running the air, air traffic control system. Yeah, that, I wonder. Right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, <laughs> listen, it's going to lose 10 or 15 planes in the first year, okay? Mm. But after that, it'll be golden. <laughs> like, you know, you just can't imagine. Well, this is the same thing with, like, uh, self-driving cars. If oh, you yeah, yeah. Right, I mean, but what if it turns out, and it does seem to turn out, that these self-driving cars will kill far fewer people, even though they will kill people. I know, it's that individual so, that's versus... that's the thing. I yeah, had this conversation not that long ago. It's like, yeah. what are the requirements of a good self-driving car? Yeah. Is it that it kills no people, or... Or is it that it kills less people? Right. I have to tell you, 
that, yeah, the but less people, people kill a lot arguing. of people. People kill a lot of people. <laughs> Way yeah, more. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's the problem. That's right. Like it is actually an improvement. So what do we do in that okay, case? Okay, so, yeah. so we so, have to accept the machine killing somebody. Fine, but then, yeah. but then who's responsible? Because right. when th- that's the interesting part of that, right? Mm-hmm. So then, if we do accept it that way, mm-hmm. uh, it, when the people kill people, right. somebody's responsible. Right. Somebody goes to jail. Something right. happens, right? Mm-hmm. So fine, let's do the same thing with the self-driving car. What if it's we not find... the car that has to go to jail, by the way. Yeah. It's not Hal that's, true. that's at fault here. Somebody right? is somewhere. We can choose to some human. slice that uh, in that way. Yeah, There's got to be some kind yeah. of uh, penalty associated mm-hmm. with that, and, and maybe it is a criminal penalty. I don't know. Well, this opens up all questions about, uh, you know, how we correct human behavior. Is it through penalties? Is it through, yeah. Enticement. Back to child rearing. Yeah, back to child rearing. <laughs> a little bit of both from That's my perspective. Great. Thanks a lot, Matt. That was awesome. Thanks, Let's Jay. do a high five here. Okay, high five. Right Wait, let me do that again so yeah. it's louder. That's perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. That's great. Fun. <laughs>